Bob and I decided that we were never going to get rich doing these vanity recordings forever. And Doug Sachs was, you know, that was at about the peak of his direct disc uh, phenomenon. And we thought, well, maybe we should look in another direction. We approached Lauren Mazel and the Cleveland Orchestra with the idea of doing a direct-to-disc recording. And his response was, it sounds like a fascinating idea, but, you know, I want to I see how it would work. In November of uh, 76, we, there, we rented a lathe from a local studio in Cleveland, along with the, the uh, mastering engineer, brought it into Severance Hall and set it up and, and did a test recording. Lauren listened to it for about two minutes and he said, great, let's do it. So in the dead of winter in January of 77, we, we brought that lathe back. We brought one from, from California. It met with mixed success. There were too many fingers in, in the pie, you know, too many, too many engineering types say, do this, do that, don't do that. Um, but it put us on the map. We realized still that making direct cut records was not the way to fame and fortune either. Steve Guy from Location Recorders called and said, if you haven't heard digital, you really ought to. There's a fellow named Tom Stockham who has a company called Soundstream. We came to the October AES, listened to Tom's recordings. These were backup recordings he had made. Bert White was doing, doing a um, recording with the Boston Pops. And Tom came along to just you know, make digital recordings to so, show what the machine could do. Well, it was pretty darn impressive. Tom at the time was looking for business. He wanted to do something with his, his new machine. And he wasn't looking to sell them. He, he wanted to rent them on a project by project basis where he would come out into the field with the gear and you know, be there to troubleshoot or he would observe its, its operation and, uh, you know, if he could improve anything, he would after he'd gotten back to Salt Lake. So we were shipping this stuff all over and, you know, Tom would meet us. Tom and some of his guys would meet us at uh, locations. We were audacious enough to say to Tom, well, we really like the way your machine sounds, but there's something about the top end that is just not quite right. We don't like the, the brick wall at 20K. We think there's something missing. And if you can get the frequency response of your machine above 22K, we'll work with you. And Tom said, I'll do it. He went back into his lab. Sure enough, in March, he called and he said, the high-end frequency response now is 22.5K. I've done it. Where's the project? <laughs> so we said, oh boy, we're on the spot. So my partner then and I, Bob Woods, uh, spent, you know, we, we started thinking, what are we going to do? It's got to be, it's got to have a lot of dynamic range. It's got to be really spectacular. It needs to show off our recording technique along with the quality of this machine. So we spent a long winter evening in front of my fireplace just brainstorming ideas. And the conclusion we came to was, well, what, what do the audiophiles, you know, what have they collected over the years that, that still, people still value? And it was the Mercury Living Presence. And mostly Frederick Fennell and the, the Eastman Wind Ensemble. Those are the recordings that I modeled my sound after. Then the next question was, do we know where Frederick Fennell was. Well, I knew that he was teaching at the University of Miami in Florida. So we managed to track him down pretty quickly. In the meantime, we thought, well, the Eastman Wind Ensemble, Mercury Living Presence things were so successful. Why don't we follow that pattern? We call, we got in touch with Fred and said, what would you think of the idea of doing a recording of some of the, you know, the classic wind ensemble pieces with the wind, brass, and percussion sections of the Cleveland Orchestra. 
Fred said, tell me where I have to come. I'll be there wherever and whenever you say. Just let me at him. So um, April, what was it? Early April, we all assembled in Severance Hall in Cleveland. And um, it was the first commercially released recording that, that was, was made with the digital process in, in this country. Um, it created a lot of stir among audiophiles. It had a bass drum that blew up speakers. Uh, and we did not, everybody accused us of hyping the bass drum. We didn't. I mean, Fred Fennell is a percussionist. He knows what the percussion is supposed to sound like. We looked around Cleveland, found the bass drum in a high school that Fred liked. He brings his own bass drum beater, which is made out of an old wooden bedpost with a knob on the end covered with rawhide. As they say, the rest is history.